back to Ask the Compound. Our email here is askthecompoundshow at gmail.com. Great questions, as always. We got our first audio question this week, which we're very excited about. Exciting. Today's show is sponsored by Futureproof. Futureproof.advisorcircle.com. Got a, got a couple things to mention here. The Hyatt is already sold out. The rest of the whole hotel rooms are selling out fast. So hurry up and get there and book your book your uh, hotel because you're not going to have a spot. I think there's like four hotels there. I liked the Paseo last time. That was that my was cool. favorite. I but like there's, that, yeah. there's plenty of good ones. Uh, qualifying advisors, $200 off at futureproof.advisorcircle.com slash downtown. We're going to have a live animal spirits there. We're going to have a live compound in friends there. We're going to have a live ask the compound there. It's going to be great. There's going to be tons of good speakers, good food, good drinks, good weather, good scenery. It's an amazing. And plus, for me, living in Michigan, it's like an extension of summer because it happens in, what, the middle of September? Right. And so it, it, it's another way to, like, keep that summer going a little bit. Also, great yeah, uh, hit the Rocky hit the Rocky video. Maybe uh, <laughs> maybe this will jog some memories from our, our longtime Animal Spirits viewers. But uh, last year we had Mike and Ben do the Rocky the classic Rocky scene. So yeah, we're already thinking about what we're going to do this year. So keep your Rocky eyes. Rocky and peeled. Apollo on the beach. Yeah, that was, uh, I still can't believe you guys talked me into doing <laughs> My that. My favorite but... part is this one. Yeah, okay. we, uh, we really did it. All right, let's do our first question. Okay, up first today, we have a question from, oh, I don't, I don't have their name here. Okay, uh, my target date fund does a lot worse than SPY. Should I just move to an index fund for my 403B? Great question, and I think one a lot of investors grapple with. So the S&P 500 is doing better than my portfolio. Why don't I just put all my money in there? Why don't we look at an example of why a target date fund is underperforming the S&P 500? Did, so John, did this do hurt a chart your feelings on. a little bit, though, that they're kind of taking a shot at target date no, funds? No, I don't think it's a shot because I think a lot of people don't understand benchmarking, which is what I want to talk about. So, John, do this chart on. I, I, just, I don't know what target date fund this person is in, so I just picked a Vanguard 2055 fund to see what's under the hood. So this is roughly 90% in stocks, split between 60% U.S. stocks, 40% international stocks, which is about the global weighting of the market cap, 10% in U.S. bonds and international bonds. So now, John, go to the next chart here. This just shows the gains this year. The S&P is up like 14%. This target date fund's up 11% or so. So why is this the case? Well, it's pretty simple. Bonds are only up around 3% this year, U.S. and international. The stock market's up 14 to 15%. International stocks are up like 10 to 12%. So listen, if your target portfolio is a 100% asset alloc or as allocation to the largest stocks in the United States and you're underperforming the SPY, then something is wrong. There's a problem there, right? You're underperforming. But if your target allocation is something different and you're using the S&P 500 as a benchmark, then you're comparing apples to oranges here. It's not the same thing, right? The, the, that's, that's one specific market. It's one specific, specific style of investing. Now, it could be the case that you need to take more risk, right? Most target date funds cap out at 90% equity exposure. I looked. If you went out to 2070, I think, is the furthest Vanguard one. It's still 90% stocks. So I think that's as high as they go. So if you want to be 100% invested in stocks, then a target date fund is not for you. I'm a big proponent of them. You mentioned it, Duncan. They're low cost. They're probably diversified. They rebalance automatically. They're simple. It's like a single fund of funds. And then they're professionally managed, so the asset allocation will change and get more conservative as you age. If that's a problem for you, maybe you need a portfolio that's 100% invested in stocks. All of my retirement funds are invested fully in the stock market, 100%, right? I take those RPMs all the way to the top. I'm not in the leveraged versions like you on some funds, Duncan, but <laughs> if you have like the intestinal fortitude to have 100% of your money in stocks, that's fine. Um, and you, that's who you want to compare it to, that's fine. But even within stocks, I diversify by international and I have different strategies and I have different types of stocks. So I, I still diversify that way. So if, if you want to have everything in the biggest stocks in the US, then that's a decent benchmark. I think I, I just think for most people, that's not the benchmark that they have. And I think a lot of times my worry is this person is talking about performance chasing, right? The perfect portfolio is pretty clear in hindsight. It's never clear ahead of time, right? So diversification means your portfolio is never going to be invested in the best performing asset class or strategy or style, but that's that's a feature, not a bug. So the question really boils down to how you're benchmarking in the first place. I'm not a fan of benchmarking portfolio performance to a benchmark simply because it's doing well or because financial media talks about it or someone else is invested that way, because sometimes a diversified portfolio will beat a, the S&P 500. Anything you diversified last year, you did much better. Right? If, if you had some value stocks in your portfolio or high-quality stocks or something else, international stocks, you did better than the S&P last year. So 
nothing works always and forever. I think you just have to figure out if that's the right benchmark for you. I look at it like this. The only benchmark you should really care about is whether or not you're on track to achieve your financial goals. That's it. Any performance numbers or risk measured should be compared to that goalpost alone. If you're trying to beat the market and you're a stock picker, sure, benchmarks matter. But I think it matters you know, what your risk profile and time horizon are. And if you set an asset allocation, that's your target. And I actually think it's kind of funny. I actually think a target date fund is a good benchmark to have. If you have an 80-20 allocation to stocks and bonds and you, you measure that against an 80-20 target date fund, I think that that's actually a pretty good benchmark. That's a better benchmark than the S&P 500. I also think I also just think the idea of constantly measuring yourself against those kind of indexes means you're always going to be chasing something else because it could, could be the Nasdaq 100 one year, it could be international stocks one year, it could be bonds one year. You never know. I also I, I just the whole thing about beating the market is always kind of funny. To Jason Zweig wrote a piece for the Wall Street Journal a number of years ago about beating the market. And I love this part. He said, uh, I'm going to read it here. I once interviewed dozens of residents in Boca Raton, one of Florida's richest retirement communities. Amid the elegant stucco homes, the manicured lawns, the swaying palm trees, and the sun and the sea breezes, I asked these folks, mostly in their 70s, if they'd beat the market over the course of their investing lives. Some said yes, some said no. Then one man said, who cares? All I know is my investments earned enough for me to end up in Boca. I think that's the idea. You, you don't you don't judge your performance against the stock market or whatever you, you think it is. You judge it against whatever asset allocation fits for you and your personality and your disposition. And, and that asset allocation should always be tied to your risk profile and time horizon. That's, that's the thing. I, I think first you figure out if, if that's the right asset allocation for you and then then you figure out you know what the right benchmark is to judge yourself against yeah it kind of becomes a keeping up with the joneses thing right it's uh yeah. it's exhausting to constantly be judging yourself so, like so that. your your benchmark is tqqq right yeah i mean hey you know i actually new experience i i started selling covered calls a while back um because i was looking for something to help offset my horrible losses How'd that and, go? Uh, and I just got I just got some some pulled away from me at a very unfavorable price that I, I wasn't <laughs> so expecting. So you got I just called found away. Another way to get chopped up. <laughs> but you earned some premium in the meantime. I hope. I did. I did. So yeah. Okay. All Not right. worth it though. But yeah. All right. It, it, that's the kind of strategy that always seems better in a bear market, right? And that, that's that's the whole problem here with any of this stuff is, anytime there's a bear market, you're gonna be, you're gonna be kicking yourself saying, I wish I would have gone into this with way less risk. And when there's a bull market, you're going to be kicking yourself and going, I wish I would have gone to this with way more risk. Unfortunately, I think for most people, you figure out the asset allocation that you can hold during both of those environments and everything in between. And that's the one you have to be find your, make yourself comfortable with. Otherwise, you're always going to be chasing something. Right. And the way I make myself comfortable with something like that scenario I just described is, like Josh says, it's like your tuition to the market, right? You know, like I didn't go to school for finance and investing. Uh, so, you know, sometimes yeah. you pay a little you went tuition. You went to film school so you could record Michael and I running on a beach in slow motion. Right, exactly. All right, next question. <laughs> okay, uh, up next we have a question from Pascal, or Pascal, I'm not, I'm not sure. Thanks to you, I am now really interested in personal finance. I have money to invest in a low-cost index fund, but I have serious doubts that the market can generate around 8% returns over the next few decades. We can't replicate the industrial revolution of the last century, and the climate crisis will have a massive impact on the world economy. Uh, world population growth slowing is a mega trend, and future generations cannot sustain the pace of growth we witnessed in the last century. In general, the Earth is a finite system, so indefinite growth is impossible. Isn't this a mathematical reality? So this was I'm the TLDR. Deep. Thinking this deep. Was, yes, this was the TLDR. This one, Pascal is actually from Germany, I guess, and he, he gave like eight more paragraphs, so I actually read them all, and kind of went bullet point by bullet point going through this. I understand the thinking here, even if I don't agree with it. Like, is there a cert, a ceiling of, of like the amount we can grow? I guess eventually. Like, the United States was once an emerging market, so the fact that we've grown so much in the last whatever 150, 200 years, can we grow that much going forward? No. Just like China has had 10% growth for the last 30 to 40 years, or whatever, they can't do that forever. So I think the low-hanging fruit has probably been picked in terms of growth and innovation. Sure, I, but I still think we have some work to do. John, give me a chart on here. This is from our world and data. Shows a share of the population living in, in poverty. 25% uh, of the world still lives on less than $3.65 a day. 47% of the world lives on less than $6.85 a day. 84% of the world lives on less than $30 per day, which is the poverty line reflective of like high-income countries. So there's still plenty of work to do and plenty of emerging markets and that I think are going to come up and have their day and, and can provide some growth, even if it doesn't come from the U.S. But... I don't know. Do I think people are going to wake up in the decades ahead and, and not want to improve their standing in life? No. Do I think innovation is going to plateau and stop happening from here? No, I think it's probably only going to get better. 
Uh, do I think people are going to stop spending money in the future? I think, if anything, we've shown that, that, that that's probably never going to happen for the United States. And do I also think corporations are going to try to stop creating profits? No. What drives profits or what drives stock market returns over the long run? Profits and dividends. So could returns be lower in the future? I, you could certainly make that case. But does that necessarily mean that like everything's going to grind to a halt and, and things are going to stop? I think if, if that's the bet you're making, that growth is going to stop completely because we've we've already run everything, we all the little all the water out of it that we can. I think the least of your worries in that situation is your stock market portfolio. Because it's not going to matter what you do with your money at all. If, if the economy just completely stops and the gears grind to a halt, then your investments aren't going to matter anyway because we're probably going to have hyperinflation or something and things will go really wrong. Now, on the climate change front, that like a lot of people are worried about that. But, I mean, can you imagine the amount of government and private spending that might be necessary to combat climate change in the future? Electric vehicles and charging stations and wind and solar and batteries. I actually think that's kind of bullish for the stock market because we have to. If, if I, I agree, this is one of the areas I'm most interested in. I'm constantly reading about you know battery storage and and electrifying the grid and moving away from fossil fuels and that kind of thing. And, and yeah, I see it as as something that could actually you know turn a turn a negative into a positive from an economic standpoint. Yeah, I think I think it, it could be more government spending, and that I think that could actually be helpful. Uh, I think, like, what's the higher probability bet here? Like, is there is there a non-zero chance that stock market returns are awful going forward? Of course, that that's always a possibility. But would you do you really want to bet your future on that and your kids' future? Like, I I think stock market returns being pretty decent or terrible. I'd rather the baseline for me is stock returns are gonna be pretty decent. I wouldn't have terrible as my baseline because it's kind of like if you make that bet, what good is it gonna do anyway? You're screwed either way. So you might as well bet that stock market returns are going to be okay going forward. Maybe they won't be as great as they were, but betting that they're okay, I think, is otherwise. What's the point? Just just spend yeah, everything I mean, you want take, now. Yeah, thinking about like don't look up style scenario. What's the alternative if you're like yeah, humans won't be able to inhabit the earth in 50 years? Well, then I mean, what what are you going to do anyway? Then you know. So to me, I, I like to be optimistic about it and think that we're going to you know harness technology. We're going to innovate. We're going to find ways where everyone's going to care more and more, right, as things start to become more and more obvious about uh, about climate and the future. And I, I don't think it'll be as politicized in the future, that kind of thing. So, so yeah, I'm hopeful. Yeah, and do we kick the can down the road and wait to the last minute to solve these kind of things? Probably. <laughs> yeah. But... <laughs> yeah, we love procrastination. Yeah, but then we're just going to spend a ton of money and get a like a really crazy bull market in a year, and then we're going to have a crash and another bull market, and so, so goes life. Yep, or we'll move to Mars. There you go. Right. All right. Go. Another question. Okay. Up next, we have a question from Justin. Hello. I'm a regular watcher of the show and other content. I really enjoy all. I really enjoy you all and find you entertaining and educational. Thanks, Justin. That being said, uh -oh, I'm confused why you continually push Roth IRAs. Why do you and Bill want everyone to pay taxes up front uh, and to avoid them later? Or, yeah, to avoid them later. The idea of low earning years early and higher later is nonsense. Isn't the goal to live off the proceeds of your investments and leave the principal alone? Is your 75% principal going to outpace my 100%? When you die, you'll have paid taxes and pass on substantially less. When I die, my family will pay no taxes. Wealthy people go out of their way to avoid taxes. Why are you recommending people pay them up front? Shots fired. Justin went harder than Paint Bill, here on Bill. Roths. Yeah. All right, let's, let's get Bill Sweet in here to defend his honor because Justin went hard in the paint Ooh. on the Roth. Ooh. Wow. That's rough, Bill. Yeah, I, I had to take the jacket off because it's heating up a little bit in here. Justin, my man. Uh, now, Bill, as, as much as you love the, the Roth as a tax-deferred vehicle, you have stated in the past on many occasions that it's not right for every circumstance. So before we – Justin – Laid out a lot. He he laid his case out here pretty. Yeah. I mean, this is this is like Stephen A. Spicy. Smith style here. Yeah. Uh, before we get into anything you disagree with here, anything that he said here that you actually agree with that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the first off, Justin, if you come at the king, you best not miss. <laughs> uh -oh. um, but I do agree, Ben, with Justin. He's got a great a, a bunch of great points. And Ben, we covered this on the last Ask the Compound uh, two weeks ago, as you recall. Where I, I did moderate my stance a little bit on Roth IRAs due to some listener feedback like this. But Justin, uh, guns blazing, I give you a lot of credit. He's got a lot of great points. I do think I've overstated the benefits of Roth IRAs. They're not applicable in cir all circumstances to all taxpayers. If you're in a high income situation now and you expect to be a low income situation in retirement, Roth ain't for you. That's what traditional IRAs and 401ks are for. 
And when choosing between Roth and traditional, um, I, I advocate that there's no reason to do both, to do, to do one or the other. Like that, that is a fallacy. And so, John, can we just pull up the first chart real quick? This is a chart I shared two shows ago, two asset compounds. If you're in the 12% bracket or less, Roth makes all the sense in the world. If you're at 32% or above, generally, depending on path dependence, I would say thou shalt not Roth. And, and that's it. I, I think that's it. Not applicable for everybody. I, John, would, can, I would say the, the, take the, chart away? the simple one yep. would be your younger, low earning years, Roth mm -hmm. makes a ton of sense. Older, mm -hmm. higher earning years, Roth doesn't make as much sense. Yep. Is that fair? Yep. Yeah, more or less. And I think the 12% tax bracket is more or less it. That right around there, it tends to be a slam dunk unless you expect to be indigent in retirement without Social Security, without RMDs. So, Ben, if you will indulge me, can I get to some, some points, some retorts for a moment the, here? The floor is yours because, <laughs> uh, yeah. Great. I so, figured. so Justin, a couple of things. Uh, first off, in your presumptions that you're not going to, your heirs aren't going to pay any tax. That, that's not right. Like, if your heirs inherit your traditional 401k IRA, they have to distribute the balance within 10 years, and that's 100% taxable to them. And so, if you don't care about your heirs paying tax, I mean, I just, I wouldn't do that. But there's no step up in basis uh, that occurs with the traditional asset. So that's a big one. Another point that I want to just debate a little bit, behavioral finance shows, this is a Harvard University paper, does front-loading taxation increase savings from 2015? It shows that when given the option, people save the same amount in a Roth 401k as they do in a traditional 401k. I was thinking that. So he was saying your 75% principal versus my 100%. Most people who do that don't then save the difference. That's it. That's right? exactly it. And so if you're choosing between Roth or traditional and you have the discipline to go out and save the balance that you would have otherwise invested, then yes, I think it's close. And in many cases, the traditional uh, 401k wins out. But where we live in the real world with real people that don't do this, don't know there's a spreadsheet, they tend to save the same amount. And so when you look back in hindsight, when you get to retirement and distribution age, if you have a traditional and a Roth IRA, your Roth IRA is worth about 20 or 30% more because it's all post-tax, right? I did and this so recently. When I switched to a Roth 401k a few years ago, mm -hmm. I saved the exact same amount. Yep, exactly. I, I didn't change what and I so saved. You, and so exactly your point, Ben, if you're cramming more dollars into the Roth that are post-tax, it ends up being worth more in retirement, assuming that you don't save the difference. And that's the key point. Uh, next is, I'm not optimizing personally for my net worth. That is a heresy in financial planning where people play this video game where they want to see their, their net worth go up every year. I don't give a flying hoot. I am optimizing in my retirement for how much money can I spend. And therefore, I am very comfortable early in my life and early years filling up those low tax brackets, stuffing the Roth into there, because when I get to retirement, I'm going to get to take all those distributions tax-free and live, live happy and, and buy my cars and go on vacations and have a good time. So that is very important. And in my experience in financial planning work, 15, 16 years of experience, Retirees taking distributions still feel the pain of taxable distributions. It is still painful for them, especially lump sum distributions, which assuming you have Social Security, assuming you have, let's say, a modest pension, assuming you have some investment income, you're probably not going to be in the 12% Oh, bracket. so you think people have a way easier time spending Roth dollars. Yes, and that, that has been my experience. And we're going to get to that question, Ben, another listener question here in a moment. Um, but if you're pushing into a higher tax bracket, then you may blow up the math. And furthermore, it doesn't account for things like Medicare surcharges, which begin to kick in or about $140,000, $160,000 of net income. So that's that's a big deal. So I'm not optimizing for net worth. I'm playing a different game, and that's okay, like, right? So for people that want to see their net worth go up, up, up every year, Roth heirs are not for you. You will definitely be better served with a traditional pre-tax dollar. Um, and then, again, I just I recommend filling up last tax bracket. So last point, John, can we go to chart number two? So I'm going to I'm going to reveal some of my bias, but like without any bias or anything like this, I want to show you guys a chart of this is federal government expenditures on the top line and receipts on the blue line. And that those, that, those numbers have not been in balance since uh, roughly the late 90s. And that's OK, because Ben, you've said this before, and I agree. The government is not a household. It doesn't have to balance the books. But when I look at these numbers, they are they are disconnected. Uh, and the prime one of the primary reasons is, John, this next chart that I want to show got the, the, the listeners. This is a history of federal tax brackets, effective tax rates, not the highest marginal rate. My opinion and my bias is we're living in no, low tax nirvana right now, and we just don't realize it. I have no expectation that tax rates are going to jump up in the next couple of years, but I don't have to because absent, absent action by Congress, every taxpayer is going to be paying about 3% more in 2026 because of the expiration of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. And so that's, that's a bias of mine. That's an assumption that's built in. But I do think that we're living in this low tax environment right now, and we just, we just don't realize it. That's why I noted that I was going to ask you, Bill, is a lot of people I feel like always assume that we know that 
you know, tax rates are going to be X, Y, Z in the future, 20, mm -hmm. 30, 40, 50 years. But I mean, there's nothing really stopping massive increases in taxes down the road, right? I mean, that's correct. And that, that's a scare tactic. But if you look across the world and look at other OECD, the major countries, the U.S. is in the bottom third of taxes. I think there's a conservative argument that that's part of what makes our economy dynamic, right? People are out there reinvesting that capital elsewhere. But, you know, the government spending is just so out, out, outpaced revenues, and there's not a political will to increase taxes. I do not think spending is going to go down. So I think just by hook or crook, this is this is going to have to work itself up one way or the Bill, other. And I, I think higher taxes are in our future. Sean in the, in the chat wants to know if you actually drew that last graph on Etch-a-Sketch. I, I didn't, because. but it might have been a big improvement. That's actually, I want to shout out a guy, Mike Bostic. I read that article uh, a couple of years ago. It's a really, really good article on observable.com. But yeah, but the, to the point of not knowing what the future holds, that's the whole point of tax diversification and yes. why I preach the benefits of diversification in everything that you do. I think income diversification is helpful. Investment diversification, tax diversification, all yes. this stuff. That, that's you. I think you, you rarely ever want to be concentrated in one thing because you're betting on the future is going to turn out this way, so I'm going to concentrate anything I do into one Correct. in one bucket. Yep, and we had a great listener question last week, Ben, that we addressed two weeks ago on Asset Compound. Please go back and take a look. But it was, should I ever have 100% Roth? And my answer is no. You should not always leverage, unless you're 25 years old and you plan to shift to traditional later. I'm probably about a year or two out, and I'm going to shift gears. But probably, Ben, the last point on this for me, I've been 100% Roth since I got into this game. And I'm 43 years old, and I'm probably mid-career right now. So I can't, I can't say more about what I'm doing with my own assets and what I help clients recommend with than, than, than that. Right. So, so great, right. great question, Justin. Thanks, thanks for the question. I appreciate. No, we, it we don't mind. We don't mind a little pushback here. Right? Bring it on. Yeah, bring it on. Yeah, bring it on. Fun. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. There's nothing like Bill. You know. Uh, you know, spitting facts with a tank shell over his shoulder there. You know? Exactly. That is, act, yeah, that is an M82 uh, high explosive anti tank round. It's not real, to, just to be very clear. Don't, don't, don't come and arrest me. Um, but I bring the heat. I bring the heat too. I like right. it. Okay. Up Let's next, we have our first ever audio question submitted. Uh, and it's it. a really good one. And it's from Joshua. And he really took time. He got it perfect. It's, it's a very good recording. So Let's I'm going to hit play on this thing. Let's listen. I have a question about HSAs. I know Ben isn't fully sold out on the health savings account, but we're fairly keen on the triple tax advantage. We opened our account in 2006 and have fully funded it every year since. We paid for one set of braces, but paid all other medical bills out of pocket. With the long term in mind, we invested in 90% equities, low cost index funds, but alas, no target date funds were available. It's been a good 17 years for stocks, and not to brag, it's $250,000 now. The question is this, how much is too much in an HSA? We're millennial empty nesters, barely 40, one child in college. House is paid for, college is all sorted, retirement is on track. My wife has a long-term chronic health condition, so health care is super important to us. But if we keep funding the HSA at the annual maximum, it'll just grow. We know it can be used as a pre-tax account after 65, and we've heard the inheritance situation is pretty rotten, but we just struggle to turn away from the triple tax advantage. Do we keep on funding it or find something else to do with these funds? Thank you. Bravo, Joshua. Great question. Yeah. Very eloquent reading skills. Way better Indeed. than I could do. The recording quality was perfect. Yeah, he, yeah. he, he did sound very, maybe yeah. he can. Uh, eloquent. He, he can do my next audio book for me. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. think. Yeah, that is good. Uh, let's see. So, I'm first of all, I'm not anti HSA. I honestly just don't have the bandwidth for another account because I have 401ks <laughs> and IRAs and SEP IRAs and Enough. brokerage accounts and 529s. I, it, it was not the HSA's fault. So, uh, having said that, I know very many smart people who who swear by the triple tax benefit. Blair Ducanet has been on this show before. She's she's talked about the benefits of the yeah, HSA. Joey Fishman, our guy in Portland, uh, yeah, loves the big, HSA. Big Bill, what say you? First, how much is too much? Because they have a they have a big amount in there. Is that ever a problem if it's like overfunded? Is is there is there problems down the road from that? 
Yeah, wow, Josh. I don't know that I've ever seen an HSA of that magnitude. I have seen six figures, but not 250K. So that is some fantastic investing. And one of the things I don't like about HSAs sometimes are higher fees. So I'm presuming that you've just got a great, great deal and a lot of discipline between you and your wife and your family. Uh, for me, Ben, it, it like the only thing better than a Roth IRA, in my opinion, is that HSA because of the triple tax exemption uh, that Josh mentioned. It's such a powerful savings vehicle, and it's very rare to see any amounts of this magnitude. So how much is too much? I, I mean, in the context of somebody's net worth, really hard to answer. But Josh, I think, hit on something towards the end of his question that to me was so important that if, he, if you've got some chronic health issues going on, like that's what those assets are going to be used for. Right. And, if, and ultimately, like that, that, as we age, and we do this in financial planning a lot, people really tend to underestimate their medical spending, right? And a lot of times when we do these Monte Carlo simulations going forward, what tends to happen is people age, their medical needs increase, and that, that ends up being a quality of life thing typically, or, or a quantity of life. But ultimately, my guess is th those assets are just doing exactly what they need to do. I would have no qualms dumping in another $6,000 a year into a balance of 250k with the plan of being the distribution in the future. And Ben, I want to mention before we close, the, the, most, the, most, the coolest thing about HSA is that the year of distribution does not have to match the year of uh, the expenses incurred. And so if you incur a, a $10,000 medical bill, unfortunately, or braces you mentioned in a single year, you can hold on to that reimbursement from the HSA for five years, for 10 years, allowing that compound effect to occur. So that to me, it's like, I, I don't know that an HSA balance could be too large for me to be concerned about it due to all the factors that Josh laid out. Right. I, I, this fact that they already know at 40, his wife has a chronic health yeah, that's very sure like to hear huge, that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, this is a huge fallback plan for them. Though. This is this exactly. is like a big time margin of safety. I also want to talk about how they're 40 and kid is already in college. Yeah, wow. What's that all about? Started yeah. young. That's I had a friend from who uh, him and his wife got pregnant like the summer after our high school senior year. Okay. Uh, and and their wow. kids are in, out of out of the house already. It's it's like a total yeah, backwards right. and they're reliving their youth. So hopefully that the Josh or not, this is a who's who's this one? Is this another that's Josh? Josh. Yeah, there's yeah. Josh, our guy Josh. Yeah, definitely can can live it up a little bit too, and and yeah. uh, obviously they've saved enough money, so they're in pretty good pretty good yeah, position. Yeah, exactly. But but I think you're going to have a lot of flexibility as as time goes forward. And again, my my guess is you are going to use that. But I, if I'm you, Josh, I'm saving every single medical receipt. You go to CVS, you pay that five, three dollar copay. That's going to a drawer somewhere, or put it in a PDF for a future tax return. Because you're right. Ultimately, you're going to need gonna... a lot of drawers if you're saving CVS receipts because they're so <laughs> big. Because they're this long. But yeah, yeah but I, I'd be stacking those things as high as you can go because ultimately you are going to want to access that cash at some point and use it to fund other goals and the best way to do that is to get that money tax free here's a question from the from the the comments can you use hsas for nursing care if you need Give it me to it i was gonna say, uh, say yeah to uh to the best of my knowledge yes i'm not a, i'm not an expert but I'll, I'll dig into that and ben if you maybe want to follow up an update next week we can, we can do so but yeah to the best of my knowledge yeah it's pretty broad on what hsas can be used for cool all right it, great, great audio. We don't, great, everyone doesn't have to question. do that, but we uh, that, that was a good first one. He yeah, yeah, good. Yeah. I, I want to wrap next time. If you can drop a beat. Oh, true. That'd be great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just not right. licensed music. Please next question about Roth IRAs. Don't Someone else likes Roth IRAs too. Let's do it. Okay. Up next, we have a question from Sam. I have a question about how to view my Roth IRA now that I'm older than 59 and a half. I don't need the money for anything this time, so should I view it as something that should only be used as a last resort? Or should I now be okay with using some of the money to pay for things like a vacation or a car, or if I could pay, even if I could pay with, for those things with other money? If the answer is that I should never touch the money unless I absolutely have to, it seems like I may never actually get to spend any of it. <laughs> okay, we kind of started down this this path earlier about is a Roth. I, I, and I never thought about that, Bill, but you're right. We've had countless conversations with clients and with our advisors about the fact that people have an easy time building wealth and, and saving because that they, they compound slowly and it builds up. But then when they have to turn around the other way, like turn the battleship mm -hmm. and spend yep. it, it's very psychologically challenging for people because I don't know how I'm going to live. I don't know what my health care expenses are going to be. Yeah. And people have a hard time spending their money. So I like the idea of the psychology behind spending Roth dollars. Now, Sam here, it sounds like, is, is going the other way, saying, what if I never spend these? So right. what do you think? How should they view that in terms of spending? Yeah, I've got two answers for Sam. First off, Sam, very strong name. It's the name of my firstborn son. Uh, just doesn't get much better. We're going to talk about Sam Sweet in a couple minutes. But moving forward with Sam, I got two answers for you. Number one is if, if I have a bucket of, of Roth, in addition to my traditional IRA, in addition to my Social Security, in addition to my pension, et cetera, for me, that lends itself to these types of lump sum distributions. Because what happens is if you right size your life based on, again, your Social Security, your recurring income, let's say your RMDs when you hit age 73, if you right size your life around those, you're paying your bills, you're, you're, you're paying your gas bill, blah, 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 every once in a while, you're going to want to buy a new car. 
Every once in a while, you're going to want a fancy dinner. Every once in a while, you're going to get a plane, fly to Paris, wherever you want to go, Bogota, you know, whatever's up to you. For me, those distributions really, really lend themselves well to Roth IRAs because they don't disrupt your tax picture. John, can we pull up chart number one if you still have that thing handy? That's the, true. So you can yep. you can look at the Roth as like a, a bonus spending. Like I want to take yeah. the all the the whole family, the grandkids and my kids on a yep. huge trip to Italy this year. We're going to take it from the Roth because it's like bonus money. And kids, we're going to do it tax-free. Uh, the, right. the tax man doesn't get a piece of that. So just looking at the charts, like you can see where these step-ups are. So if you're right-sizing your life, let's say hypothetically, somewhere at the high end of the 24% bracket, you, you know, you've got a lot of income, pension, whatever else, you don't want to jump up in that 32% bracket by taking a $100,000 distribution to buy a new truck or a Tesla or whatever it is you want. So that that is perfectly lends itself to a Roth because furthermore, it doesn't mess up with your IRMA, your Medicare uh, expenses on a monthly basis. So that that's answer number one. Answer number two for me is if, if, if you've got all your needs funded and if you don't need that asset at all, it is a fantastic estate planning, uh, pass it on to the next generation asset, right? So I would not, I would not have that at bullet point number one, but assuming that all of your lifestyle needs are cared for and you're taking your kids out to nice dinners, you're enjoying the retirement that you so richly deserve after working and saving for years and decades and doing it all right. On the back end, the Roths are great because on your passing, the kids have another 10 years to distribute that asset. They leave it to another account. It comes to them completely tax-free. Going back to question number one for Justin, it was a great question. Your heirs are going to pay tax on your traditional IRA balance. Does so, that work like an RMD where you have to take one-tenth every year? You do not is the way it works for most taxpayers on the SECURE Act. There's a technicality there, Ben. If, you're, if you inherit an asset where the person had already been receiving an RMD, you do have to continue those, but not at one-tenth. It's based on your life expectancy. But So really, there's just a final RMD at year 10. If I inherit an IRA today, uh, tw uh, 2023, I need to distribute all of the balance by December 31st of 2033, or I've broken the law. So your, your children are going are gonna to learn to love Roth someday. Right? They're going to be getting a lot of Roth dollars coming to them. Well, I mean, you would think so. If I have an untimely passing, then yes. But my goal, Ben, is to spend every freaking dollar that I'm saving here. <laughs> right. I, my kids are on their own. I'm going to help them pay for college. I'm going to get them on a good feed. I'm, I, might, I might help them out with a vehicle or something like that. But after that, they're out of the house and they're on their own. And they've got to do it the American way. Exactly. Uh, yeah, I just I do push back a lot on ta on clients and taxpayers generally. This goal of passing money on to the kids is insane to me. Go out and earn your own money. Do it do it the right way. I, I think that's the way to, to raise children in 2023. That's, it's that's it's my Shaq that said uh, that told his kids, you know, that's not your money. It's my money, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. yeah, and if you have a lot of traditional air balance, that at least twenty four percent of that's the IRS's money. So, um, so again, back to Justin. Great question, but yeah, uh, tax free. I want to. If I pass on assets, I'm going to do it through a Roth. Perfect. Okay. It's beautiful. A lot of Roth stuff as usual. I think. Great. I think we. I think we landed in a good spot with a Roth here. Today. Yeah, it was a good. And again, I Justin totally support the feedback. I've been way overzealous. Can I give my man Sam Sweet a shout out? Yeah. Let's do it. Let's uh, do it. So speaking of you know, a gentleman named Sam John, can you pull up that photo? Uh, Sam Sweet's uh, kindergarten graduation was today. Uh, he graduated with about 18 of his, of his buddies. I'm just very, very proud of him. Uh, quick story, in his preschool graduation a year ago, he melted down to a puddle of goo and began crying. <laughs> uh, but what he told me, I said, Sam, what do you want to do? What do you want to do this weekend? He said, Dad, I want to go camping. And if you see a bear, I want you to punch him in the heart and then kick him in the privates. And then he ran away <laughs> to play with his friends. Okay. And I have never been so proud. And I just wanted to share that for posterity. 10, 20 years from now, I'm going to show Bill, this the, to him. The great thing is my, my kids are done with kindergarten this year, too. We didn't have a graduation. I didn't get to... Uh... I didn't get to go that route, but uh, our kids are going to graduate high school the same year. My twins are, are both moving on to first grade as well. Oh, congratulations, Ben. Our, our teacher tried to pull that crap, and we were like, no, we're coming in on this day, and we're going to gather, and we're going to celebrate. And the kids got, uh, got candy, and it was awesome. So, okay. Congratulations. Par participation ben. trophies still. Congratulations, proud dad. <laughs> All right. Way awesome. to go. All right. We always appreciate your comments and emails. Remember, askthecompoundshow at gmail.com. Keep them coming. Every week we get a full inbox, so we really appreciate it. Uh, voice memo works too if you want uh, and if you're listening in podcast form please leave us a review YouTube subscribe like all that good stuff you know what even if you're not listening if you're in the chat right now go and still leave us a review on uh, Apple or Spotify or whatever you know? we would and, really appreciate and it. thanks as always to the people who show up in the live chat we always appreciate yep. it thanks, see Sean. you next time etc thanks, I got everyone. you Justin <laughs>